It was an unknowable amount of time later that the enemy began to fall back. Perhaps more accurately, they failed to pursue the withdrawing Imperials. No more of them drifted from the golden mist. No hunched silhouettes or screaming warriors or ravening beasts emerged from the fog to hurl themselves at the rear guard. Knowing this prescient moment of peace wouldn't last long, Ra made ready to repel another wave. First and fifth ranks, fall back! First through the third, fall back! Most of the exhausted warriors collapsed where they had. They were seized by muscle cramps in their first moment of peace in untold hours. Grav tanks and relatively fresh warriors took their places, advancing in place of the exhausted waves of their kindred, who had been held and holding until now. Ra slumped to the ground, his muscles in spasms physically unable to bring himself to rise. The stims and adrenal spikes were wearing off at last, forcing him to confront the reality of his overworked body. He was poisoning himself with sleeplessness, his blood rich with chemical stimulants, and his thoughts prey to the distortions of a brain refused the mercy of rest. By his loose calculations, he had been awake now for fifteen days, fighting almost every minute since the walls fell, his ears endlessly ringing with a vox-crackling orchestra of conflicting voices. His body was eating itself for nourishment. He struggled to stare aware of how the evacuation was proceeding further along the passages, but there was no word beyond the arc mechanendrite's absence and the predation of foes from many of the side tunnels. His thoughts were dull and slow, his reflexes slower. Everything he saw was stained by the graying haze of exhausted starvation. Fifteen days. His right shoulder had seized days ago, yet there had been no respite. It throbbed with crippling cramps from the sheer repetitive weight of hammering his spear down over and over again, thousands of times each day and night. The tall form of Baroness Jaya's castigator was a motionless statue above them, staring back into the mist, waiting, just as they were waiting. Diocletian had done well in finding her. Viridian's knights were precious assets in the close-quarter brutality of those tunnel battles. Dodarian, another of the lords of Terra, collapsed into the road next to Ra, lying atop the last three legionaries he'd slain. Dodarian's trembling hand managed to drag his blade-split helm free, burying his features to the ashy air. The custodian sucked it in, in great wet heaves. There was very little left of Jadarian's face. He left some of it in the inside of his cleaved helmet reduced to a red smear. Ra looked at the gaping, bloody skull next to him, all that remained of Jadarian's head, half of the teeth hammered away, lost at some point in the last few days. The wounds had clotted almost at once, but the damage was done. Ra suspected he looked little better. The legionary nearest to him was still alive. A world eater bisected at the waist was dragging himself closer to where Ra had kneeled. His armor was more red than white signifying some unknown change within his treasonous legion. Blood! The warrior murmured through a shattered mouth. I was there. Ra tried to growl at him, but the exhausted words were a snarling whisper. I was there the day we saved your mongrel Primarch from certain death. Blood! Blood! The world eater mumbled again. His helm had been crushed, savaging the skull and face within. His eyes were glazed, maddened, the pupils mere pinpricks. If only we'd left him there, the custodian laughed, feeling his re bones and abused muscles stinging afresh with the squirted application of adrenal elixirs from inside his armor. Blood! If only we'd left him to die in those mountains. Ra was smiling now. The only Primarch who couldn't conquer his world. The one Primarch who lived as a slave. The one Primarch who had to be saved from death. Blood! <sighs> the world eater's eyes resolved with the ghost of clarity. Blood for the blood! A spear ran through the world eater's spine, driven down between his shoulder blades. The power pack on his back shorted and died. The warrior himself went into convulsions, eyes that had so barely cleared now rolled back into the broken head. Above him, Solon wrenched the weapon left, then right, and finally pulled it free. The custodian collapsed a breath later, using the world eater's corpse as a seat. This has been the worst day since yesterday, Solon said with no trace of a smile in his tone. Ra rolled onto his back, first seeing the empty mist above, then looking to his right. He saw Zanamadio, 
The Terminator forced down to one knee, his fire pike lost or broken who knew how long ago. Grinding gyro stabilizers in the cataphractized suit's joints sought to bring the warrior back to his feet. Bazanamadio slouched forwards, head lowered. He refused to rise from his crouch or he simply couldn't manage it. Instead, adopting the pose of an ancient knight kneeling in prayer before an altar. Blood had dried while running from rents in his battle plate and from his mouth in a slow left trickle. When he lifted his head to look at Ra, a dirty chasm of scabbed blood and broken bone showed where one eye and one ear had been. Bare skull glistened in the gold mist. Unable to speak, Zanamadio grunted. Ra tried to force a nod. Instead, his eyes fell closed. He opened them a second later, an hour later, a year later. The Mechanicum's tunnels were gone, as were his kindred. He stood in the throne room, the Emperor's laboratory as it had been half a decade before, not as it stood now. The walls lacked the hive-like hollows of thousands upon thousands of recesses awaiting stasis coffins. The machinery spat no sparks. The Emperor didn't sit upon the golden throne. The great engine thrummed with automation, independent of the Emperor's presence, yet slave to his invisible will and the ambitious heights of Imperial dreams. Hello, Ra. Ra turned, feeling the broken bind grind of his malfunctioning armor. He tried to kneel, but the Emperor stopped him, a hand gripping his custodian's pauldron. The Tribune grunted his gratitude. Do you remember this day, Ra? The workers performed their duties around him, maintaining the rumbling machines and tending to the connective pipeline and power couplings. It could have been one of any number of days in the throne room before. No. There. There was Valdor. There was Amon. There was Ra himself, one of the twenty of the highest-ranking custodians present in a loose pack, speaking in voices too low, too far away, for Ra's wounded manifestation to make out. Ra's mouth curled in a tired smile at the sight. How innocent we were. He knew of what those ghosts spoke. He remembered it well. He even followed the movements of Amon's lips, his memory providing the voice he couldn't hear. There has been no word from Akilon. Akilon. Prefect of the Hakanatoi. The Oculi Imperator, eyes of the Emperor, assigned to watch over Lorgar in the waning years of the Great Crusade, Achillon, who had never returned from his vigil. One of Ra's own dynastic squad had traveled with Achillon on that long, distant mission, Sithran, a warrior who had surely also fallen to the word bearer's treachery, perhaps even on Istvan itself in the high hour of treachery. Stoic, dutiful Sithran, Ra hoped he had died well. I remember, sire, said Ra. He watched Amon speaking of Achillon, seeing one of his finest companions mouthing the very last word spoken before the sirens sounded. The sirens began to sound. Time is short, Ra, said the Emperor. Men and women were standing still around them. The shouts were starting to rise, accompanying the flashing warning lights. The gathered custodians spread apart in an effortless awareness of each other's killing reach, the most loyal hands in the Imperium reaching for their spears. We may not reach the dungeon, sire! Even here... Ra's voice was a cracked ruin. The Mechanicum has abandoned us, and the convoy is near undefended. I know, my custodian, I know. It is meaningless now. More shouting. Workers and scientists were running now, moving away from the overloading machines. The culmination of the throne room took on a strained, desaturated cast. Constantine Valdor ran to the Emperor's side, oblivious to the fact his master was playing no part in a performance that had at all happened before. The Emperor had turned to him then, Ra recalled, and said, Summon Janisha Kroll. Assemble the ten thousand. This time, though, he did not. At once, my liege! Valdor turned away to make it so. Ah, uh, something's coming! Something's coming through! Cried one of the human workers. The Emperor ignored the spreading chaos. Hear me, Ra. You must take word to the ten thousand in the silent sisterhood. I am leaving the Golden Throne. I am coming to you. Ra's blood sang. Eyes wide, he felt riven by sudden hope. It struck him with physical force. Sire! How? The how does not matter. Hold, Ra. Fight. I will join you in the Mechanicum's tunnels. But my liege, all, all your work! The Emperor silenced him with a stare. Behind Ra, the discolored webway portal vomited incandescent flame into the throne room. He felt its searing heat just as he had on that day long ago. He watched himself with exalted, distracted eyes moving to the Emperor's side, forming a shield of custodial armor might to protect his monarch from harm. 
The machines were detonating around them now. Many of the humans were on the floor clutching at their bleeding eyes. The hateful radiance emerging from the webway had stolen their sight. Those still not standing were no safer. Shrapnel flew in a lethal burning blizzard, cutting them down in their dozens, shearing limbs from bodies, severing heads from shoulders. Wreckage clattered against Ra's armor now just as it had rained upon it then. He had seen it. He had seen this five years before. A dagger of jagged metal spearing its aim on side, causing the custodian to grunt across their shared vox. A bleeding, desecrated behemoth melted through the webway portal. It dripped with the blood of souls it had sacrificed to reach this point in space and time. Laughter haloed its terrible form. The laughter of mad entities pantomiming as gods. Their laughter formed the silly strings of puppeteers, pulling at the creature's limbs and thoughts. It said one word, one terrible proclamation with enough psychic ferocity to slay half of the panicking humans still breathing. They warped and thrashed and burned beneath the pressure of that single telepathic damnation. Their flesh losing all integrity, their essences devoured from the inside out. FATHER! Valdor was firing. Amon was firing. Ra then and now was firing. He and the image of himself reloaded in temporal harmony, slamming fresh sickle magazines home and their guardian spears, resuming the torrent of upward bolter fire. The pain of Ra's wounds was gone. He didn't think, didn't care that this was a memory. He unloaded his guardian spear into the demonic avatar of Magnus the Red, just as he had done on that fateful day. He screamed through clenched teeth, again just as he had done before, just as he was doing now, not two meters away. Awaken Ra, said the Emperor. Fight on. And as ever, his custodian obeyed. Kida's captives sang as the machines began their work. In none of the circumstances and possibilities that she had considered would the doomed prisoners sing. She couldn't hear them. Couldn't even be certain they were singing at all. She was only alerted to this unforeseen behavior by one of the tech adepts retracting his secondary arms into his robe and turning his sun-starved face to the coffins above. Hundreds of them were bound to the wall, chained in place. They are singing, he said in faint wonder. Kira's narrowed gaze saw a host of emotions on the various captives' faces. Some were shouting in their soundproof pods, beating their fists bloody against the transparent panels. Some were curled in fetal positions and seemed to sleep. Several even seemed to be in silent rapture, utterly calm and composed. Others lay with their heads back, eyes and mouths open, and... Yes, she could imagine, just about, that these last souls with their rigor and mortis expressions were tortured singers. She had believed they were screaming, given what was being done to them. It seemed far likelier. What could they possibly sound like? She could summon one of the young novices who hadn't yet owed her tongue to tranquility, to ask on her behalf. Yet as Kira stared around the chamber, hearing only the rumble of the Golden Throne's supplemental generators, she felt grateful for the gift of her hollow heart. Some questions needed no answers. She turned her gaze to the enthroned emperor, feeling the acid bitter irony. Here sat her king, committing his consciousness to the machine created to save a species, and yet, chained in place across the chamber and trapped within parasitic coffin pods, one thousand prisoners screamed in silence and psychically sang their souls away, batteries for the throne, so the emperor might be free. Human lives reduced to sources of psychic power. Sacrifices. The thought set her scalp prickling. The throne room's power flickered for a moment, on the edge of failure. Machines around the chamber slowed, several of them giving ugly whines of protesting mechanisms until the power stabilized. One of the coffins emitted a hauntingly gentle chime as the data panel on its surface flashed red with warning signs. The first one has died, Kira thought. Died already so soon. Upon the throne itself, as the generators around the chamber hummed louder, the Emperor of Mankind opened his eyes. This is now. All of her memories, all of those dens reeled to a close, no longer lying on the grass hearing a distant storm, no longer confined in the cargo hold of a spaceship, treated as a slave. They were then, and this is now. Skoya opened her eyes. She is bound within her own coffin, bathed in a tremulous sound. It rises octave by octave, and she thinks of a deep-sea monster, ship-eating creatures stirring and thrashing upon the lightless ocean beds as they begin to rise. She breathes in, managing only a shallow mouthful of air. Her heart beats slowly, so slowly. 
She presses her hand to the thickness of the vision panel, knowing instinctively that it isn't for her to see out. It is for her captors to look in. To see her, to see her, to see her if she's still alive. To see her if she still lives a moment more. Her next breath is harder than the first. She has to fight to suck it in, and it scarcely gets past her throat. Already on the edges of her vision, it begins to darken and gray. She beats her fists against the window, making the coffin sway gently, the motion no different from a rocking cradle. Her third breath barely comes at all. In that moment, she cries out, not with her mouth, but with her mind. She screams for the spirits to come to her. She beseeches them for aid. She curses them for their silence. Panic drives her past holiness into blasphemy, and still she screams. Other, other criers join her. Some, like Skoyas, beseech ancestor spirits or the memories of the lost. Others are offered up as desperate prayers to the emperor or the false and half-forgotten gods of distant worlds. It is the unified cry of people drawn from hundreds of cultures voicing their psychic gifts in terminal harmony. Not all are pained. Some are obliviously joyful. Others are sixth-sense distillations of helpless rage or simple, crude fear. The chorus of outreaching emotion rises, and the battalion of interconnected machines all run louder, harder, in sympathetic response. She is fading now. Her breaths no longer come, and that only amplifies her silent cry. She slumps forward, cheek pressed to the unbreakable glass, her lips trembling, her eyes wide and shivering. The stiller she becomes, the darker her sight falls, the louder she screams inside her skull. And now, only now, does she hear the melody of the other souls of the one thousand sharing the same fate, suffering what she suffers. Their screams and prayers and panic and fears entwine, unseen by all, and form one sound, one impossibly perfect note. Those outside the coffins may yet hear it, but its true purity is unheard by any but the dying souls themselves. It is the very first note in a song that will last ten thousand years, and perhaps beyond, she, Skoya, is its first singer. The battle was fast underway, and they were losing. Ark and Land watched as Zephon fired his last shot and ducked back into the darkness of the tank's interior to reload. The spent magazine clattered to the deck as he slapped a new one home. Hauling himself back up into the copula, the blood angel braced again and opened fire once more. The techno-archaeologist, his face bleached with scrolling viewscreen data, veered the tank in a slow arc. Volkite cannons squealed in a rhythmic discord. Small arms fire rained down against the blessedly reinforced ceramite hull, reduced by the dense platings to bull and dual bangs. The grav raider's interior reeked with the porcine scent of burned gore. Wounded sisters and custodians lay across the deck of the hull, too injured to keep fighting. Land could only assume that several of them were already dead. Zephan ducked back into the tank and slammed the copula closed. I am out of ammunition, he stated. His eyes glimmered with what Lan suspected quite correctly was battle lust, a rather primitive emotion that the Martian thankfully had no experience with whatsoever. The blood angel locked his bolter to hip with a thumbed activation of magnetic seals. He crouched by one of the injured sisters who had clutched the stump of her arm and was holding it against her chest. The severance of her left arm was the least of her wounds, if the running of blood beneath her was anything to go by. Something had gone badly wrong inside of her during the battle. A sword through the guts, most likely, thought Land. A pathetic way to die. A death worthy of a primate in Terra's stone era. He loathed the female warriors, and couldn't for the life of him fathom why. They were private, yes, but seemed agreeable enough. Yet merely looking at them made his skin crawl. Being near enough to smell one of them, or Avnasaya forbid, accidentally come into contact with one of them, was enough to make his bile rise. He was even more careful not to stare towards the enemy. The raider's automated and servitor-manned Volkite array was more than capable of responding to threats. The last time Arkin had longed to look out across the enemy horde, he'd been unable to summon speech for several minutes. No aliens, no matter their world of origin, walked as a host of blade-bearing, cyclopean corpses able to ignore the butchery of their own flesh. Many of the horned, grave-born entities seemed animated from Imperial dead. Shattered plates of golden armor still tumbled from their boated flesh. Zephan aided the sister with her wound bindings. His metal hands twitched, but not enough to ruin his efforts. Lan knew that the cure such as it was wouldn't last long. It was too hasty, too fragile. Fixed as it was to the back of the blood angel's neck and crudely drill-locked into the meat beneath the armor to say nothing of the cables and wires running along the outside of a ceramite to link in fifty places across each forearm. 
Zephan rose again, clambering back up the crew ladder. The metal rungs bowed beneath his weight as he opened the copula and looked out at the battle. Blood of the angel! What? What is it? What now? The dawn. He intoned, drawling and unfocused. Jaya had no idea what he meant. So, something is, said Arkan Land, looking right back through the vision slit. His curse was a breathy whisper as he blinked tired, gritty eyes. Teeth of the cog! Their neighbor, Jaya, turned towards the techno-archaeologist. The unhealthy radiance of the viewscreen was gone from the explorator's features. Instead, he was bathed in a white light streaming through the vision slit. Dust motes danced in the beam of illumination. What is it? she asked. I, well, I, I, I don't know, Arkin stammered. It, it, it looks like the sun is rising. And, in a sunless realm, the sun rose at last. The light of dawn was palpable on Ra's armor as well as his skin. It was a pressure. A presence with searing physicality. The enemy hordes felt it as acid on their skin. The creatures, demons no matter what secular truths held strong, lost what little order they had ever possessed. Anathema! Ra heard the frantic agony as six scraping on the edge of his mind. The, the anathema comes! The sun rises! The anathema! His features were those of one born in the wild lands of ancient Eruja. His skin was a Terran blonde of bronze and burnt umber. His eyes darker still, his hair darkest of all. The long, black fall of his hair was held by a simple circlet crown of metal leaves, binding the mane back from his face so he could fight. More practical than regal. He moved as a man moved, coming through the straining ranks of his guardians on foot, pushing through the press of bodies on the rare instances they didn't instinctively move aside for him. He wore gold, as all of his guardians wore gold. The same sigils of Terran unity and imperial nobility that showed on their armor were cast thricefold upon his own. His armor joints didn't growl with the crude industrial snarl of mass manufactured legionary plate, but purred with the song of older, purer technologies. On his back, held by a simple strap against his flowing red cloak, was an ornate bolter of black and bronze. In his hand, he carried a sword. One that looked nothing like the blade portrayed in the Victory Murals and illustrated sagas. By the standards of Terran lords and kings, it was inarguably beautiful. But in the grip of the ruler of an entire species, it was, perhaps, rather plain. A weapon to wield, a tool for shedding blood, not an ornament to be admired. Impossibly complicated circuitry latticed its blade, black and coppery against the silver so hollowed that it was almost blue. In other wars on other worlds, he had greeted his custodians with subtle telepathy, speaking their names as he passed them before a battle. Here, he was more restrained, moving to the embattled front rank without offering any acknowledgement at all. Of the never-born, some broke ranks and fled. These cowardly shards of their vile masters knew their destruction had come. Some tore into each other, cannibalizing their kindred for strength in the face of destruction. Some lost what little grasp they had on corporeality, their forms melting and dissolving before the sword-wielding monarch even reached the front lines. The strongest raged at the sin of his existence, with a gestalt below, loud enough to shake the windless air of this alternate reality, they fought to reach their arch enemy. Ra was at the Emperor's right side, spear whirling, lashing out to punch through the amorphous bodies of flailing blue creatures that wailed through their many mouths. Sweat baked his face inside his helm. The blood in his muscles was heavier than liquid lead. Order, sire! The Emperor raised his sword in a two-handed grip. As his knuckles tightened, the geography of circuitry ignited along the blade's length, spitting electrical fire and wreathing the sword's length in flame. He didn't speak. He didn't look at any of his warriors. The sword came down. The webway caught fire. Shapes raged in the flames, shadows and suggestions doing battle with the demons, their fiery forms indistinct and ever-changing, the fire-born avatars of fallen ten thousand, knee-deep in psychic fire and thrusting with lances of flame, the silhouettes of space marines, the betrayed dead of Isvan bearing axes and blades and claws, half-seen sigils of slaughtered legions obscured by the ash of their blackened armor, 
a giant among giants, its great hands bared and ready as it seared forwards at the crest of the tidal fire, the tenth son of a dying empire, so briefly reborn in his father's immolating wrath. Demons burned in their thousands, their etheric flesh seared from their false bones, white flame haloed from the sword in a corrosive, purifying radiance. It's coruscated in thrashing waves from each fall of the Emperor's blade. To look at him was to go blind, to stand before him was to die. And with a roar the custodians followed their lord and master. They reeved the Neverborn, banishing them with each thrusting spear and bellowing bolt gun. Their blades carved through demonic flesh, sending acidic blood raining in corrosive sprays. It was a mist that occluded sight now. It was ash from the incinerated dead. Spears flashed silver in the dust-thickened air. The last charge at the Ten Thousand. Behind the Golden Warriors came their arming thralls, bearing fresh ammunition and armor sealant. Warriors in their own right, but sheltered from harm by their master's spinning blades. It didn't matter that all these years of secret war had depleted the Legio Custodes to a ghost of itself. It didn't matter that they had fought and bled and died for the last half decade in the sunless, merciless realm populated only by the dead and the damned. Their king had come. The sun had risen, and they charged with a cry that far eclipsed the wails of the demons dying on their blades. The beast that survived the Emperor's onslaught staggered and lurched towards the custodians, raising brittle blades and dissolving hands uselessly, staring through bleeding, blinded eyes. Something dead. A creature hunched and bloated, still bearing within its flesh the plague that had slain it, lunged at Ra. His spear thrust burst its eye and cracked through the malformed skull, hissing and bubbling blood sluiced through. Ra's gauntlets, steaming as it burned away in the Emperor's aura. He loosed his last explosive bolts, sensing the weapon was empty before the warning sigil flashed on his visor. Reload! Ra cried as he hurled the weapon back towards the armory thralls, already drawing his meridian swords in its place. The curved blades ripped through diseased flesh, spilling rotten organs at the misty ground. The sword's energy field spat kinetic aggravation at every impact. A rune chimed on his retinal display, flickering white. He sheathed the twin sabers in a smooth turn and caught his guardian spear as the ammunition thrall threw it back at him. The moment he had a fist around its haft, he was killing again. This was the way of his kind. For Ra time ceased to exist. There was nothing but the beat of his heart and the lactic burn of his muscles. All he saw were the blades and claws flashing towards his face. The ash of dying, dissipating Neverborn coated his armor. Reload! Solon called from behind him. Ra heard the snap crack of Solon's meridian swords activating and the rumbled murmur of compliance as the armory thrall gathered the guardian spear left thrust into the ground. Ra parried a cut from a heavy brass blade, returning a blast from his digital lasers that blew the creature's face out of the back of its sloped head. Demonic slop from the burst skull rained across the Emperor's back, turning to ash before it touched the monarch's armor. Torrents of chemical fire marked the Zanmadio's position to Ra's left. Ra could hear the draconic roar of incendium pikes, burning the still thrashing creatures that had fallen beneath the blades of the custodian's first rank. The Ten Thousand and their Golden King were shin-deep in ash, the smoky specters of demonic entities flailing as they were swallowed by the Emperor's fire. The demons that managed to reach the Emperor suffered worst of all, the strongest, most savage of their kind. They swung weapons at a man who was no longer there, cleaving through golden mist that swirled in his place. With thundercracks of psychic force, the Golden Warlord would appear at the beast's backs, his flaming sword already buried in their spines. Fire erupted behind their eyes, boiling and bursting them from within. Their sizzling gore soaked raw in the custodians closest to their sire. Exultation quickened Ra's blood, the cure to the weariness that had slowed him. He was still tired beyond belief, yet that had never mattered so little. Each beat of his still living heart was vengeance, vindication. We're winning. He could feel it in the renewed curses and oaths across the Vox as the Ten Thousand advanced. They weren't just holding their ground. Whatever genius the Emperor had worked in order to stand with them in this final hour had worked. Nothing could stand before them. The Emperor turned to Ra, hurling his sword as a spear. It lanced over the custodian's shoulder, driving to the hilt in the skull of the creature Ra barely even saw before it was reduced to a burning sludge. In a flare of sun-rich mist, the blade was back in the Emperor's hand, spinning, falling, killing. And still the Emperor advanced. A reptilian canine leaped at him only to be ripped apart through the air where he had been standing. It gurgled molten blood as the Emperor's sword manifested within its throat. The warlord clutched it in place a second longer before ripping it free and moving on.
Still the enemy came, a tide, a flood. Ra stole glances back at the Wraithbone gateway, so incongruous against the Mechanicum's machinery. Watching robed unifiers passing into the blood mist, escorted by packs of the last surviving Silent Sisters. Soon enough, only the ten thousand remained at their master's side. Be ready, Ra. Welish? The custodian launched himself over the slumping form of the vulturish creature that had fallen to his final six bolts, hurling his spear back behind the front line and drawing his meridian swords while still in the air. He landed by the emperor, back to back with his master. Their blades wove a lattice of silver light, eviscerating everything that approached their edged web. Be ready. For what, sire? Ra's retinal display flashed its white sigil. He caught the returned weapon, spinning it with the force and speed of a rotor blade. The tunnel around them cracked and sparked with the strain of overworked generators. There, Ra. It draws near. The Emperor moved on, cutting, carving. He led his guardians into the very horde of a mythological hell. And like the paladins of yore, they followed their king. Rare emotion spiced the Emperor's silent words. I sense such purity of being. Such pure, unadulterated malice. Ra weaved back from the swinging axe blade, returning a spear thrust that punched through the creature's scaled throat. He dared a glance left to Diocletian, seeing his kinsman hauling his own spear from the innards of a pot-bellied, horned grotesque, impaling a prize of rotted entrails. Flies droned around the decaying tangle, swarming at the loss of their hive. Even immortals could tire. Ra's breath sawed between his closed teeth inside his helmet. Sweat drew lines of wet fire down his face. His retinal display kept auto-dimming to compensate for the fire and light bursting its being with each fall of the Emperor's blade. I see only the horde, sire! He didn't like the rap fascination in his lord's tone. Reveal thyself. The Emperor raised his blade, bringing it down in a crescent of fire. A tide of flame bellowed forth in an incinerating arc, bathing the ranks of the Neverborn before him. Mortis Ash blasted back in the windless air, coating the closest custodians in the dust of dead demons. A shadow. A shape in the ash. A man. Just a man. Long of hair, dark of skin, tribally bearded, wearing jewelry of a shape, bone, and hearing, and bearing a spear of napped flint, fine lashed to fire-hardened wood. A man wearing wounds almost as grievous as those he had inflicted upon so many others. Hundreds of spear slashes and sword cuts marked his flesh, the freshest and bloodiest showing on his chest, the legacy of Jaya's last blow. One man leading the ranks of howling madness behind him, the echo of the first murder. The Emperor's words broke into Ra's skull with crushing gentleness. Anathema! Was it sick, slick reply? Predators always revealed themselves in the seconds before they struck. Wolves howled as they chased. Sharks cut the ocean surface with their fins as they hunted. Here, the ashen silhouette moved through the Neverborn's ranks, lesser creatures parting before its too human tread. Whatever the creature's true form, it wasn't this muscled stone epoch warchief. It merely aped the form of the first humans. For the first terrifying time, Ra saw doubt flicker within his master's eyes. The sight flooded him with the unfamiliar taint of dread. Sire, Ra whispered, we should, but the emperor was gone. Monarch and demon ran at one another, sliding in and out of existence, outpacing their lessers on both sides of the battle, and the two entities, one of salvation of a species and the other its damnation, met blade to blade. Blood burst into the ashy mist. The emperor arched the warlord's body taut with the utter unfamiliarity of agony. Five talons, each one the length and width of a spear, dripped red as they stood proud of the emperor's back. Ra had heard tell that every man, woman, and child saw a different face, a different skin tone, a different temperament when they looked upon the Emperor. The Ten Thousand had no experience with such an effect. They considered it doggerel from the strains of unready minds when confronted by a true immortal. To Ra's eyes, the Emperor was a man like any other. The custodians saw only their master. In that moment, as the claws ran red with his king's blood, Ra saw what the rest of the species saw. The boy who would be king, an old man cloaked and hooded, life running from his cracked lips, a knight in his prime, maned with dark hair, crowned with a wreath of laurels, a barbarian warlord, barbarous and strong, grinning through teeth turned red with his leaking blood, images, identities, men who once were men he might have once been, men who had never drawn breath. The Emperor's boots left the misty ground. He barely even struggled as he was lifted, impaled by the five spearing talons. His sword fell from his gloved hands to disappear in the shrouding fog. 
to the emperor ross screamed the order loud enough that his retinal display blurred for half a second to the emperor's side he ran killing faster than he'd ever killed energized by an adrenal cocktail of loyalty hatred and the alien touch of something nameless that tasted foul on the tongue not fear no never that surely never that i am the end of empires the thought wasn't raw's own it belonged to the silhouette in the ashes the emperor's killer speaking by twisting the thoughts of the humans in its presence a wrenching violation with crude cruel fingers pulling at the insides of raw's skull forcing his thoughts to form the demon's words kill it Ra shouted half an oath half an order the man shape turned in the settling ash still holding the emperor above the ground the warlord clutched at the impaling arm his telepathic voice was raw stay back all of you stay back i am your death the creature promised the emperor perhaps one day but not this day Gold light flared bright enough to blind unshielded eyes. The Emperor manifested at Ra's side, bent down on one knee. One hand clenched to his chest, hair hanging down to veil his features. Blood, human blood, no matter what the legends say, ran in runnels from the Emperor's sundered armor. Ra! The sending was thick, with pain, defiance, and then... Ra! He said aloud, raising his eyes to meet his loyal custodian's horrified gaze. A blade ran through the Emperor's body, an ornate sword as much as sorcerous bone as metal. A weapon with writhing, shrieking faces soul-carved upon the steel. The faces shrieked as they drank the Emperor's divine life. It thrashed as the Emperor clutched it in his hands. It was alive, starving, its form rippling and growing indistinct. With a cry, the Emperor pulled the weapon free, unsheathing it from his own body. He hurled it from his grip, casting it aside with a surge of armor-boosted strength and devastating telekinetic force. Rob blinked once with the impact. Feeling it as a thundercrack against his chest, he swallowed, finding himself unable to breathe. Blood streamed from his mouth, denying the passage of air. It was a blade through his body. It was a demon embracing him. It was a disease in his blood eating at his bones. It was there and it wasn't there. Everything and nothing. The custodian fell to his knees, hands curling around the impaling blade. The thwarted rage of the demon sent nerve pain, lightning bolting through his fingers. Why? Ra asked his king. The emperor stood tall once more, looking down, eyes cold. In that moment, Ra knew. The emperor's words spoken what felt like an eternity ago flashed through his blackening mind, infusing his thoughts with red revelation. To illuminate you, the Emperor had said, as they looked upon the wonders and sins of the galaxy's past. You will fight harder once you understand what you are fighting for. And now he knew. Ra and Dimian, the one living soul shown the entirety of his master's dreams and ambitions, an enlightenment not gleaned for the purpose of waging war, but for this. To know the truth when all others believed in shadows and fragments, and to suffer that the truth was in him until it tore him apart. Ra rose on shaking limbs, leaning on his spear for support. The sword was gone now. The demon was within him, caged by his flesh, bound by his agony-drenched will. He felt its tendrils circling his bones, wrenching at them, thrashing in its need to reach the master of mankind. The creature tunneling through his blood would never stop never die. It couldn't be destroyed, only imprisoned. The custodian didn't meet his sire's eyes. He didn't demand any explanation or apology. Ra was born to serve, raised to obey and chosen for the greatest illumination preceding the darkest duty. Inside him raged a beast even the emperor couldn't kill, the demon destined to end the empire. Every step he took away from the emperor, separating this demon from his master, would mean another day that the Imperium stood unbroken. The Emperor still bled, still clutched his wounded chest with one gloved hand. Blood flecked his lips. When all that remains is ash and dust, he said, straining. Be ready. The sword rose and once more it fell, fire tidal waved from its killing edge, immolating all in its path, clearing the way. 
the Neverborn dragging themselves over the ashy remains of their kindred tasted the same destruction. The Emperor spoke to Rawl one final time, a single command heard by no other. Run. Rawl and Dimian, Draknan's golden gowler, the son of a water thief, obeyed the last command he would ever be given. He ran. Last bit. The death of a dream. Diocletian tore his helm from his head, breathing in the ozone and machine stink of the Imperial dungeon. Sweat sheened his face, blood painted his armor, much of it his own. He was the last one through. The tunnels are detonating! He declared, breathless. Golden mist still pulled at his armor from the portal behind him. The circuitry is igniting! Whole sections of our tunnels are falling away into the mist! I couldn't see Ra! He didn't die, I'm sure of it. I was at his side. I would have seen! He knew he was raving. He didn't care. He spat to clear his mouth, spattering treachery blood on the floor of the Emperor's throne room. Beyond the ringing in his ears, he was aware of a sound, some kind of mechanical droning, a hum falling slowly through the octaves. Diocletian's spear clattered to the ground, deactivating the second it left the gene coating of his grip. Blood followed it, running from wounds too deep to swiftly seal. The blood round down his arm and surfaced to the breaks in his aramite, dripping from his curled fingers. Seal the gate, he ordered, not even knowing if it could be done. They're still coming, thousands of them. Seal the gate now or we lose Terra. They were already trying, he saw. Adepts and engineers clustered around the machines, working the controls of each system. His war-struck thoughts made the connection with the slowly mechanical drone. The chamber's attendants were deactivating the machinery, but not fast enough. A single glance at the coffin pods in the sockets told him all he had to know of what happened in his absence. Of how the Emperor had been able to come to their aid, the Sisters of Silence had enacted their secretive unspoken sanction. They fed the throne with the lives of a thousand psychers, and every pod he could see a corpse that had thrashed in its death throes, raking uselessly against the transparent panels. All of them were dead. Every one of them. None of them looked to have died swiftly and painlessly. Confusion reigned across the Vox and among the gathered warriors as to the sources of their salvation. Some had seen a dawning star or a sunrise. Others had seen the Emperor himself. Still, others claimed to have witnessed the tidal surge of fire. Everywhere, men and women were lost and dazed. Baroness Jaya was there on the chamber floor, her helmet in her hands, unblinkingly staring at her reflection in the visor. The blood angel, Zephan, was helping carry wounded sisters from Land's Raider. The techno-archaeologist himself was kneeling on the ground by his battle tank, rocking back and forth, his trembling hands clutching a necklace of Martian prayer beads, his delicate fingers stroking each bauble of volcanic obsidian in turn. My omnissiah! He was chanting softly, eyes unfocused. My god, the machine god, my om omnissiah! Sagittarius lived. His chassis scored and ruined, the smokestacks on his back belching unhealthily from his overpushed generator. The dreadnought had his back onto the side of Land's tank, leaking vital fluids from its eternal sarcophagus in an oily puddle. Sisters and warriors of the Ten Thousand gathered in monumental disorder, all of them looking to the portal's arch, all of them hearing the slow drone of machinery powering down. Diocletian was still demanding answers of the others when Kura came to him. Where's Ra? He asked her. Did he make it back? He didn't fall. I know he didn't fall. Her eyes tightened with tension. He didn't fall, Diocletian repeated. I was there, next to him in the battle line. I would have seen it. He'll be on the wrong side of the gate when it closes. Sister Commander Kroll came to Kira's side, signaling briefly for Diocletian's benefit. He didn't know her as he knew Kara. He couldn't read her meaning by expressions alone. Her signaling was blighted by the fact she had lost three fingers from her left hand. Wounds patterned her features while her armor showed the ruination of too many hours in the front lines. No! I was at his side, Commander. He didn't die. One moment he was there, the next he was not. Machines were going dark all around them. Great engines of the Emperor's own vision. Centuries in the design and decades in the making were cycling down, hemorrhaging power slowly, slowly, far too slowly. Diocletian sought the emperor himself, seeing his master ascending the steps to the golden throne once more. My liege! The emperor enthroned himself, his grip loose on the armrests. Sire, seal the gate! 
The Emperor waited, staring towards the portal. Even from such a distance, Diocletian could see the intensity of that stare. The Emperor fixed his gaze on the gateway, waiting, waiting, hesitating to do what must be done, reluctant to abandon his greatest ambition, or hopeful yet that another figure might manifest from the golden fog. A shape darkened the mist, something winged and clawed, another figure bloated and horned, and more, others, a host of inhumanity. The throne engines were still cycling down. Sire! Diocletian pleaded. The emperor closed his right hand into a fist, clenched within his glove. With a harmonious pattern of thunderclaps, every generator within the chamber went dark, their internal mechanics rupturing, starving the golden throne of energy. The archway that led to humanity's doomed salvation was nothing more than an ornate doorway, leading to the bare rock of the throne room wall. Power failed completely, plunging the imperial dungeon into darkness.